Let us give attention to the word of God. Let us realize that God is speaking. Imagine him right in your presence speaking his word. And don't be glib when we read the word. And give full attention to it. I always think of that myself whenever someone's reading the word. And I'm tempted to kind of reach for something or get something. And I imagine if Christ was standing right before me, would I be doing what I'm doing right now? I think the same whenever the preaching goes on as well and the temptation to communicate or whatever, would I dare do it if Jesus Christ was standing in the flesh? I don't think I would. So it always brings tremendous conviction that everything that can wait and should be set aside when God speaks, everyone else needs to be silent and give whole attention to the Word of God. So let us give that attention to this portion of His Word. Song of Solomon, chapter 1, reading from verse 1. The Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine. Because of the savor of thy good ointments, thy name is as ointment poured forth. Therefore do the virgins love thee. Draw me, and we will run after thee. The king hath brought me into his chambers. We will be glad and rejoice in thee. We will remember thy love more than wine. The upright love thee. I am black, but comely, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, as the tents of Kedar, as the curtains of Solomon. Look not upon me, because I am black, because the sun hath looked upon me. My mother's children were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but mine own vineyard have I not kept. Tell me, O thou whom my soul loveth, where thou feedest, where thou makest thy flock to rest at noon. For why should I be as one that turneth aside by the flocks of thy companions? If thou know not, O thou fairest among women, go thy way forth by the footsteps of the flock and feed thy kids beside the shepherd's tents. I have compared thee, O my love, to a company of horses and Pharaoh's chariots. Thy cheeks are comely with rolls of jewels, thy neck with chains of gold. We will make thee borders of gold with studs of silver. While the king sitteth at his table, my spikenard sendeth forth the smell thereof. A bundle of myrrh is my well-beloved unto me. He shall lie all night betwixt my breasts. My beloved is on to me as a cluster of comfort in the vineyards of Engedi. Behold, thou art fair, my love. Behold, thou art fair. Thou hast dove's eyes. Behold, thou art fair, my beloved, yea, pleasant. Also our bed is green. The beams of our house are cedar and our rafters of fir. Amen. May the Lord bless the reading of his word and be pleased to open up before us here tonight. Let's still our hearts again momentarily in prayer. As we come to his word, may the Spirit shine oh so brightly upon the pages of Holy Scripture. O oh God, it is for this we seek, even at this late stage, for light, light, O oh God, give us light. Without light, there is no seeing. And we pray that thou wilt give that light that we need in thy word. Give light to all, give insight and understanding to all. Give us, O God, that heart that wants to hear and those eyes that desire to see and that longing that we have to to feed on Christ. May it be satisfied tonight. May our souls be thrilled with glimpses of Him who is the very love of our being. O help us, help us, O God, to love Thee more. Help us to be moved and motivated by all that is right and holy. And grant that Thou wilt bless us with the sense of Thy nearness. Come and draw near, walk up and down in the hearts of this, of those that are gathered here tonight. Make thy presence felt amongst all that are seated before us. And even for me, O God, fill me with thy spirit and grant me thy help and power, wisdom, love, understanding, oh, to communicate thy word with the sweet influences of the spirit of God. Grant us that help and be with us now and do thy work, saving and sanctifying For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We are dealing, beloved, with one of the more unusual books of the Bible. 
this book called The Song of Solomon. And as I've said to you already in the introductory message, essentially, and then I kind of went over it briefly last week, though not in detail, uh, the fact that the interpretive method and position that we are taking is really that which is common among the Reformers and the Puritans, though not exclusive to them, uh, certainly we identified very much with their grappling of Scripture and their uh, hermeneutical methods, as it were, when it comes to the Word of God generally, and also when it comes to this book of the Bible. Not each of them will agree on every single line, but there is an overarching way of looking at the book of which, in which they are united, where their interpretative view of this is to see that the primary message of the book is not a manual on human relationship. It's not. It is conveying to us the relationship between Christ and his church. And whether you read Matthew Henry or whoever of that era, 1700s, 1600s, 1500s, you will find them holding to this view. And even right up to recent times, you'll find men who still hold to this view. And this is a view that we take as well. We believe that it fits with our understanding of the purpose of Scripture That scripture is not given as a manual for merely the the practical things of life. Like all scripture is given by inspiration and in its inspiration it is designed to convey to us what Jesus Christ reflects in Luke 24 that it's about him. And it seems amazing to me that someone can say the scriptures are all about Christ. 65 books of them at least. And then one of them, one of them has nothing to do with Christ and nothing to do with his church. Really? I think it highly unlikely. We also perceive that the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 5 shows that marriage reflects the relationship between Christ and the church. And that marriage essentially is given to be a very kind of real perspective and kind of uh, walking uh, image of that love that exists between the Lord and his people. That the Lord has given that marriage then, and in a time whenever we, we don't fully see it, in a time where we don't fully comprehend it, there will come a time when the love between Christ and His church will be full, will be as profound as it can possibly be. And in that place called heaven, there is no marriage. There is no marriage. Jesus said so. Because the ultimate marriage has taken place, and the ultimate relationship is already entered into. But while we're on the earth, God has given marriage so that we understand something of what truly awaits us. And never forget that when you read the Word of God, and it, it, it strikes me so much at times whenever I read through the Scriptures and I see, especially in the book of Hebrews, and chapter 11, where particularly I'm thinking of Abraham, where he realized that he is seeking for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. People follow Abraham and they come after and they say that we have the faith of Abraham. And maybe they do. But they fail to see what Abraham understood. They're all about the temporal. It's all about the earthly Canaan. And it's all about the here and now. But Abraham knew he was a pilgrim and stranger. And he realized that there was something promised to him that far exceeded how those promises would be reflected on the earth. And so the land that was promised to him as posterity would have its greater fulfillment in heaven itself. We must see and perceive things more deeply than I think we we tend to uh, when we are so carnally minded and kind of so earth bound. Last week we looked at verses 2 through 7. And in those verses, the general theme, and there's dialogue here and back and forth, so it's hard sometimes to get a kind of general kind of thing that's going on without being too repetitious. But uh, we saw generally there was was this this conveying of the fact that the, the bride is at a distance from the king. And she is not as close as she wants to be or as she needs to be. And it seems that she has awakened to this and there has been the sense of realization that I am not as close as I need to be. So she is desiring, look at verse 4, draw me, draw me, I need to be drawn. And verse 7, where she says, tell me, O thou whom my soul loveth, where thou feedest. I don't know where you are, 
But I want to know where you are. I want to be where you are. Oh, bring me to that place where you are and where your flocks are. And so there's a distance between them. And she longs for that distance to be removed. And so she is really being brought from what we would call, biblically, a backslidden state. A state of being away from the Lord. Christians come into this condition regularly. Regularly. From one week to the next, Christians may find themselves drifting. From one Lord's day to the other, is it any wonder the Lord is appointed one day in seven for the good of our souls? We need it. We go from one week to the next struggling, struggling to sustain a walk with God. We find that the dust of the world gets onto our feet. And very quickly, if it's not washed off and rapidly dealt with, that that dust begins to creep up and cover the whole of our being. And so God has appointed a day in seven where we are, we are encouraged, where he sets us down and he begins to wash our feet. He begins to sanctify us through his word. And we need it. We, we desperately need it. Well, may you be drawn even closer tonight. And as we progress this evening, looking at verses 8 through 17, we will see her further encouraged and awakened to her love for the bridegroom. And so uh, tonight we're considering these verses under the heading, The Awakened Bride. The Awakened Bride. I want you to note with me, first of all, the counsel she receives. The counsel she received. This is in verses 8 through 10. If thou know not, O thou fairest among women, this is being said to her. Here's the bridegroom communicating to her. The king is saying, If thou know not, O thou fairest among women, go thy way forth by the footsteps of the flock and feed thy kids beside the shepherd's tents. I have compared thee, O my love, to a company of horses and Pharaoh's chariots. Thy cheeks are comely with rolls of jewels, thy neck with chains of gold. You will notice that he points her in a certain direction. Go thy way forth. Go thy way forth by the footsteps of the flock. She knew that he would be found where his flock is. Verse 7 conveys that. O thou whom my soul loveth, where thou feedest, where thou makest thy flock to rest at noon. Where are you? Where are your flocks? Because where your flocks are there you will be. And so he conveys back to her and shows her this fact that she is to go a certain way. She is to go a certain way. You see, the Lord wants to direct us in the right way. When we come to him, when we come and we think again of the context of how we're looking at this, there's a distance here. When the believer begins to realize there's a distance between him and his God, and they desire to be brought back, the Lord is not reluctant to draw us. He's not. He doesn't torment us. And this needs to be underscored, especially for those who have lost out with God for a long period of time. Christians sometimes get to a point where they feel themselves to have lost out with God, they're badly backslidden, maybe they've fallen into grievous sin. And they think that they can never get back to the place where they once were. And it's a lie, it's a satanic lie. And it's a carnal perception of the gospel. The Lord has no desire to keep us at a distance from himself when we long to be near to him. David understood this very clearly. After all the grievance that he would have caused the Lord in a certain sense, in his rebellion and his sin and the awfulness of what he did in lying with Bathsheba and ordering the the affairs so Uriah is, is murdered essentially, that he understands when he is restored in Psalm 51. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, he prays. And he realizes that there can be a restoration, a full restoration, in which he can teach transgressors thy ways and sinners will be converted unto thee. That he can continue to be a servant of God and useful in the hands of his God. That even with what he did and his months of spiritual decline and backsliding with one call. He has this confidence that the Lord would restore him. The Lord will draw him back. Oh, you, you, go, you go down through the lines of Psalm 51. You see how confident David is in the midst of all of his own sins. He understands that God is still faithful. 
God has no desire to keep you at a distance from, his, from himself. He will come and respond. And so here you have the bridegroom responding here. And it is told to her, go thy way forth. Go a certain way. Where is it? By the footsteps of the flock. He's confirming her perspective, isn't he? He's saying, yes, you're right. Go where the flocks are. Go by the footsteps of the flock. <laughs> Very obvious application there, isn't there? If you want to be restored and get back where you need to be with God, what do you do? Get amongst the right company. Get amongst those who are with God. Get amongst those who know God. Get amongst those who worship God. This is, this is I tell you, when, you're, when you are not walking with the Lord, when you're not where you need to be, one of the, 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 where you need to be is in the place of worship. And even more than that, even more than that, sometimes, sometimes what is even more restorative to our souls is the place of prayer. To get in the place of prayer. And when you can't pray, when you're, when you're not calling upon God and you're finding it hard to pray and you hear the prayers of other believers and you're encouraged to join with them in prayer and to enter into prayers with them and then sometimes you'll find even your backslidden heart will be moved to call out along with them. That's essentially what was conveyed in, in verse 4, was it not? Draw me, we will run after thee. If you draw me, others will come. And when one believer is close with the Lord, it has an impact upon others. And when one is communing with God, when you hear the cry of a saint communing with God profoundly, deeply, longing for God, desiring God, looking for God, that can sweep us along with them. A place of prayer is a powerful place for restoration. And so get where the flocks are. Get where the sheep are. Get where God's people are. Don't neglect. It grieves my heart. That so many feel they can come to church once on a Sunday. It grieves me. I wish they didn't see it that way. I wish they didn't understand it that way. I wish they felt the need to be as often as possible with the flocks. Why? Why must we be with the flocks? Here's what the, the king is saying. Go thy way forth by the footsteps of the flock. If you're looking for me, find my people. Find my people. You know, the church leaves footsteps, leaves footprints, go thy way forth by the footsteps of the flock. Find where they have already tread, essentially. Look for their mark. I like that. The church leaves footprints for other believers to follow. Much of what I have learned, I have learned from the dead as well as the living. To be able to lift the literature of godly men and godly women, to see the legacy that they have given to us, and to read it, and to meditate on it, and to see the footsteps of the flock, is tremendously reviving. I have encouraged you before. I take time to say it again. If you want to go on with God, read Christian biography. Read what the saints have endured, what they have experienced, what they have expressed. Go on with God by learning from them. Follow in the footsteps of the flocks. These pilgrims who have gone on before, beside the shepherd's tents, feed thy kids beside the shepherd's tents. You see, go to where the shepherds can be found. This is even more specific, isn't it? She is directed to go to those that carry out the work of the chief shepherd. They, under, they are under shepherds of the chief shepherd. And so there are these, these other shepherds, the shepherd's tents. So go thy way forth by the footsteps of the flock and feed thy kids beside the shepherd's tents. Go to where they are, where the shepherds are. The Lord, you see, has appointed men to direct the flock and to help the flock and to feed the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made them overseers. He intends us to learn from them and to be blessed by them. There are a number of scriptures that come to mind here, but the one that first came to my mind was, is found in Hebrews chapter 13. Turn with me there, please. Hebrews chapter 13. As I say, there are a number of passages, but we have a lot to get through tonight, so let's just... 
restrain ourselves and look at Hebrews 13, verse 7. And of course, the, Hebrews 13 really is dealing with what brotherly love looks like. Let brotherly love continue. And that brotherly love is reflected in a number of ways. You see it, hospitality there, verse 2. Remembering those that are suffering for the cause of Christ, verse 3. Love also is reflected within marriage itself. And all our conduct, verse 5, and all of that. And then you come to verse 7. And it says, remember them which have the rule over you. Implication being that some do have the rule over you. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God. Remember them. You're not to forget them. There's a reason why you are to remember them. Because they are doing a work that you are to recall to mind. And their life, their testimony, the word that they speak specifically, because that's what's referred to, is influential in your life if you really will submit to it and give yourself to it. But remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation, or we might say their conduct or behavior. The end of their behavior. Look at their behavior. Why do they do what they do? Why, why do they live how they live? Why do they give themselves to the work that they give themselves to? Why do they do that? What's their end? Is it not because they realize that they serve one who is in heaven? They, sure, they serve a chief shepherd? And as they keep in mind the fact they're serving the chief shepherd, giving their life for the chief, chief shepherd, doing the work of God for the chief shepherd, then as they seek to do that, they have a faith that you can follow. No, it's not a perfect faith. It's not an impeccable faith. But it's a faith that can be followed. I can think of those, many, that I can follow their faith and have followed their faith. The, the, the testimony of their life leaves an imprint And I I thank God for the Spirit's teaching so that I might go forth by the footsteps of the flock and feed thy kids beside shepherd's tents, going where men who have ministered the word are, learning from them, following them, whose faith follow. Christianity is not an independent experience. It's not to be, well, what you know about God and what I know about God is different and it's not to be in any way kind of uniform. It's our own unique experience. Certainly the Lord brings us along our own path in the sense that the trials you go through will not be the exact trials that I go through. Our circumstances are not precisely the same, but there's a tremendous uniformity in the experiences of the people of God. And their faith, the life that they live, is a faith that is to be followed. It is not to be the mindset, I'm going to carve out my own path. If you do that, if you're walking where the saints have never walked, you're, you're in error. You're wrong. Overarching all of this, undergirding all of this, is where this is stemming from is essentially the fifth commandment. Honor thy father and thy mother. Not just referring to your physical, biological parents. But to those fathers God gives to us in our lives, those mothers in Israel, God has given them to us that we might follow their faith, that we might follow in their ways and learn from them. We are not to depart from the ways of godly men. This is tremendous application to the church, and I just touch on this now and really just drop a seed for you to ponder. If it's true that we are to follow the faith of believers, if we are to follow their path, If we're not to depart, if we're not to be novel, that's essentially what it's saying. Don't be novel. Don't be novel. Go where they have gone before. Follow in their way. If that is the case, how should the church look generally from one generation to the next? Should it be changing all the time? Or should there be a uniformity so that our, our worship, our praise, our, our Christian life is comparable to those of a life gone before? That, that's really what the fifth commandment is, is doing for us. The fifth commandment hems us in. Not in a wrong sense, in a right sense. We are to honor our father and mother, our, our spiritual leaders and those that God has used in our lives, we are to honor them. 
We are to honor them. We are to remember them and follow in their footsteps. And as we follow in their footsteps, essentially what we do is do the same thing they did in a different generation. But it doesn't change. We do the same work. And so Paul can say to Timothy, Timothy, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Don't change. Regardless of how you're received or what the spirit of the age is, don't change. Keep at the same work. You don't have to think, well, we're in a different age. Now we'll communicate the word by screens and video representation or, or mimes and acts and plays. No, no. We don't have to be novel. We follow in the footsteps. We continue to do the same thing that has been done for a millennia. And if that is the case, and I believe that's biblical, then why is it the church has changed so much in these days? I'll tell you why. We have broken the fifth commandment over and over and over again. We just keep breaking it. I'm going my own way. I'll have my own form of Christianity. It's part of the reason why I read the larger catechism in the Lord's Day morning. It, it roots us back to a heritage that we can be thankful for. The Word of God nowhere encourages being novel. Nowhere. I know that the expression of Christian faith can sometimes look slightly different based on, on uh, cultural differences amongst nationalities. It can. It can look slightly different. But even then, there, there will be a certain uniformity. There will be a focus on the word. There will be the engaging in prayer. There will be kind of some sim- there's similarity there. And if you're going to go on with God, you're not to go to new paths. Feed thy kids beside the shepherd's tents. Go where the shepherds are. Follow them. Whose faith follow? I've said more than I intended, but I trust the point has been made. If we're going to go on with God, the king says, follow, follow those who are near to me. Feed thy kids beside the shepherd's tents. What is that saying? That is bring those under your care with you. Bring those under your care with you. The whole family is to seek Christ together. One of the things that grieves me most is the division amongst families encouraged by the church. I've mentioned this Recently, so I'm not going to get into it again. But suffice to say, my understanding of church is very simple. We worship together. Now, right now, my wife is out of here. She's trying to watch and listen as best she can with an 11-month-year-old who isn't always as quiet as she should be. Or we would like her to be. We understand that. You don't want to upset everything in that kind of way. But at the same time, at the same time, at any opportunity to stay in the house of God with the children, they will be there. I, we've never, never, everything from Lord's Day services, Lord's Day in the morning, Bible class if it's there, uh, evening services, communion services, the children have always been with us. For every part of it. We bring those under our care with us. Bring the kids. The young ones that is. Bring those tender ones with us. And so we should bring them together. That's why the children come to the prayer meeting as well. They come with us. That's what it's saying is it not? Feed thy kids. Bring those ones who are under your care. Bring them with you. Don't leave them away. Bring them with you. The word tents here is really the word tabernacle. It's not the same as what's used in verse 5. Verse 5 talks about the tents of Kedar. And those, that's a different word. Here, the word tense is tabernacle. So it's a shepherd's tabernacle. It really gives that sense of worship, that place of fellowship. That which was common to the Old Testament believer, that sense of tabernacle is where where we go, where God is. And that's being conveyed there. And then we come to verse 9. I have compared thee, O my love, to a company of horses and Pharaoh's chariots. Tremendous words that is used here, O my love. My love. There's an exclusivity here. The deep love here. And I have compared thee. 
compared thee to a company of horses and Pharaoh's chariots. If you pay attention when you read the word of God, you will know that Egyptian horses were regarded as some of, some of the best in the world. And they were, it was always tempting to want to have more Egyptian horses. The Lord gives repeatedly warnings to Israel, don't go down to Egypt for their horses. <laughs> don't go there. And the reason, the motive why Israel would go to Egypt for horses, for warfare, for battle, um, for any other practical reasons, the reason is, is because they, they would begin to trust and then that's exactly what the psalmist reflects. Some trust at Psalm 20, some trust in chariots and some in horses. But we remember the name of the Lord our God. And that was what the Lord desired his people to do. Not to trust in horses, wonderful as they are. But trust in me. I am your deliverer. I am your strong tower. I am your victor in every difficulty. These Egyptian horses were world-renowned for their strength, their agility, their speed. And these fine horses, they can be admired. They can be admired. It's not that we are not to admire them. We can admire them. And so the admiration that generally was held by people toward these horses is reflected here. I have compared thee, O my love, to a company of horses and Pharaoh's chariots. These are the most valuable horses on earth. And you have that kind of value to me. These particular horses, of course, were not just Egyptian horses. They were the horses in Pharaoh's Pharaoh's chariots. So these were the creme de la creme. These are Pharaoh's horses and chariots. These aren't the horses that the average Egyptian is using out in the field while he does his agrarian work. These these are the horses that 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 are purebred. These particular chosen horses by Pharaoh. And so it is for us. We are a chosen people. A chosen people of tremendous value to the Lord. We read in Psalm 149 verse 4. The Lord taketh pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. What What a picture that is. He takes pleasure in his people. He takes pleasure in his people. Just as Pharaoh took pleasure in his horses and just as everyone could admire that, that aspect of, of their armies and so we are admired and loved by the king. And verse 10 says, Thy cheeks are comely with rolls of jewels, thy neck with chains of gold. This, this reflects exactly what we just said in Psalm 149, verse 4. He will beautify the meek with salvation. He beautifies them with salvation. He beautifies them. Thy cheeks are comely with rolls of jewels. There are ornaments upon her which reflect her, reflect an imputed beauty because this isn't inherent to her, is it? This is beauty that is added. This is beauty that is imputed. This is beauty that is contributed to rolls of jewels, chains of gold. This is something that has been given to her. It's not that inherent beauty. It's that beauty has been added to her. What a picture this is of the beauty that the Lord has given to his people. That he beautifies the meek with salvation. He makes them beautiful. He takes the glorious person of his son and his impeccable life. And he gives it to his people. Jesus, thy blood and righteousness... My beauty are my glorious dress. I hope you get, oh child of God, I hope you get the imputed righteousness of Christ. I hope you think about it. For it's a doctrine rarely discussed or taught upon. And I try to bring it out whenever I can. That you grasp that your beauty before God is an imputed beauty without being tainted, without being blemished. It has been credited to you. And whatever the beauty of your character, your nature, whatever it is, the real beauty is an imputed beauty. Rows of jewels, chains of gold. And he, he sees this on her. He sees that beauty that's placed upon her, that he even has given to her. Never forget the language of Ephesians 2 verse 10. We are his workmanship, 
created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in him. But we are his workmanship. He, he is taking to us as a goldsmith would take to that, that pure gold. And he has in his view what he desires so that that kind of indistinct lump of gold, though it has a certain value, it needs to be crafted so that the beauty is truly seen. Same with that rough diamond. That There's a tremendous value in it, but the beauty of it isn't seen until that jeweler takes to it. And he begins to work on it and polish all the facets and, and bring out the brilliance of it and the clarity of it and the purity of it. We are his workmanship. Thank the Lord. Thank God we're not on our own and trying to make ourselves beautiful, beautiful before God. But you have here, secondly, the help she has promised. The help she has promised. Not only the counsel she receives, but the help she has promised. Verse 11. Now you may think verse 11 is being said by the king, but it's not. It's not being said by the king. It's being said by the daughters of Jerusalem. And they are saying here, those daughters of Jerusalem that have mentioned in verse 5, they're saying, we will make thee borders of gold with studs of silver. We will make thee. We're going to add to your beauty the daughters of Jerusalem. Who are the daughters of Jerusalem? The daughters of Jerusalem are the other believers, as it were. They're the other members who have a, a, a love and a, an attraction toward the same king. I know there's a specific union here between the, the king and the, the bride and the bridegroom, and that's being conveyed, but, but there are these other voices that come into this, this whole narrative at times. And it shows, it shows this, this at times that it's not just about the individual and their walk with God, that there's certain helps that the Lord has along the way. These daughters of Jerusalem. And they are saying, they are promising that they will help with her beauty. We will make thee borders of gold with studs of silver. They don't add to her imputed, imputed beauty, but they highlight her beauty. And how do they do that? What is going on here? This is the influence of the church upon the people of God. It's the sanctifying influence of God's people. When we are around the Lord's people, they make to us borders of gold and studs of silver. They make our lives to look all the more beautiful. Look at your life. If you spend, spend a month with God-hating, Christ-denying, sinful people without any contact with God's people and see how you struggle to maintain your purity and your holiness. You'll know it yourself. Some of you know what it is to struggle with these things to greater and lesser degrees. Depends how mature you are, how strong the Lord has made you, and to what degree you face temptation, because different workplaces can be different in this regard. You work, you work in certain environments where there's lots of, lots of interaction. I mean, if you go to an office and you shut yourself in, you can kind of protect yourself. You can clock in, clock out, and you don't have to really hear or see a whole lot. You can withdraw a little. But work in hospitality. I call that hospitality. It's wrongly named, of course. There's nothing hospitable about it. But work in that, in that area. Work in restaurants and hotels. We are constantly interacting with people. You're constantly talking. And there's, there's lots that goes on, goes on and said. And, and there's lots of impurity in the discussion and talk. and all. It's, it's an awful place for a Christian. Very difficult place. And if you, you, you spent week after week, month after month in their presence, they will try to tear you down. Go on to the building side, the work side. Be amongst those who are, you know, uh, of the trades. Go up and work in the oil rigs and this kind of thing where they're rough and ready. And there's a sense in which they, they almost feel that they have to convey the, 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 the depravity of their mind in order to be accepted within the community. That the more depraved their speech and their thoughts and the way they get on, the more they might be accepted within the society. And you try to live in that environment. See, God has us to come with his people. Not exclusively. I'm not saying that. We're not to like hide away in some communal compound and run away from the world. It's not monasticism that we're preaching here. But God's people have an influence. A sweetening influence to us. God uses, uses us to help one another. We are constantly helping each other. 
Go and spend an afternoon with a Christian and talk about the Lord. <laughs> and you will come away refreshed. We are to help in each other's holiness. Make thee borders of gold. Christian, make sure you're making borders of gold, gold and studs of silver for other believers. Try to make them go on with God. Encourage them. Encourage them. Thirdly, the worship she offers. The worship she offers. Verses 12 through 14. We will see the worship that she offers. Comes back to the bride here. And it says, While the king sitteth at his table, my spikenard sendeth forth the smell thereof. Let's just look at this before we read on. We see here the position of one, the king. That's how she sees him, the king. Do you see him that way? Do you see the Lord that way? As king? (laughs) Don't read over that and just pass over it and think of it as nothing. The king. Remember Jesus Christ is king. You remember that. You remember that. The unbeliever doesn't want to acknowledge that. But the believer should embrace it and love it and treasure it. It's tremendously encouraging. To see Christ as king. To see what he does for us as king. That that, that he governs over our affairs. Dealing with all of his and our enemies. He is always working on our behalf. And if we don't accept him as king. And all the implications of that. We only do ourselves more harm. You see also his place. Not only his position. His place. Because he sitteth at his table. He sits at his table. And the... Word table here is just one interpretation. It could also be uh, couch. It could also has this idea, really literally in the Hebrew, it's kind of this idea of of, of compassing around, gathering around. And it may be the picture of a company gathered around together or the king gathered around where the bride is. But whatever the case, it's a scene that is relaxed. I think we could say that. It's a relaxed scene of fellowship. So you have the king sitting at his table so he's relaxed there, and, and, and he is, he's there. And she says then, My spikenard sendeth forth the smell thereof. Spikenard was an aromatic essential oil. It's been used for millennia. And the presence of this relaxed king, this king that's in her presence, causes the bride to pour out the spikenard. You see that? My spike nerd sendeth forth a smell. I, I, I bring the spike nerd in the presence of the king. Does it remind you of anything? Does it? Well, just in case you can't call it to memory, turn to John 12, please. John chapter 12. Because what's going on here is a scene that is familiar to many believers that takes place in the life of Jesus Christ. John chapter 12. Here you have Mary. And we are told, John 12, verse 1, Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. See the gathering around here? The kings gathered around. And then what takes place? Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. What a scene. This is such an important scene. There's tremendous emphasis that's placed upon it. It is going to be spoken of of a memorial of her, according to Mark 14, if I remember correctly. And this scene conveys to you a king sitting around and one of his worshippers, one of the ones that love him profoundly, comes and brings something that was very costly and precious to reflect her love for him. This spike nard is the kind of thing that people would want to keep for themselves for whatever reason special occasion their marriage maybe even the death of a loved one special occasions Mary had this set apart 
for, for years perhaps. Maybe even it was passed down from family. We don't know. We don't know how she got it. This is worth about a year's wages. What's the average wage here? Let's, let's say forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000. This is, this is what she's got. Forty or fifty thousand dollars she's just going to pour out before her king. And she has absolutely no hesitation. None. She is looking forward to it. She has been anticipating it. She's just been longing for the right opportunity to say to Jesus Christ, I love you. I love you. There's nothing, nothing more valuable to me than you. No one. Nothing on this earth. See this, this, this. I am just going to use it to reflect my love for you. To everyone now, you stand in that room with that box. This is what happened to Judas. He looks at it. All he can see is the money in the box. He can just see the dollars and cents. That's all he can see. Not for one second does that unconverted wretch begin to see the real value in the room is not the spike nerd. It's Jesus Christ. And he had never seen it. He had never recognized it. It's like church today. There are some, there are some, and they sit there, and they find value in this, that, and the other. Whatever it is, they might find value in how they feel good about themselves coming to church. Or they find value in the sense of nostalgia singing old hymns. I don't know what it is they find value in. But the real believer, they come and the value is Christ. Others, they find value in the, in the, the message that the preacher gives. And, oh, he's an inspiring preacher or, you know, he helps me or whatever. They find value there. But Christ, Christ is the pearl of great price. He, he is the valuable one in the midst. And she takes this. And she wipes his feet with it. Even his feet are worthy. Of this and far more. How is your love for Christ? Are there things that he could ask for that you would never give? Are there limitations in your love and service? It wasn't for Mary. And there wasn't for the bride here in Song of Solomon. While my king sitteth at his table. Oh look, did, did Mary get, did she get inspired reading this? I don't know. I can't say. While the king sitteth at his table, my spike nerd sendeth forth the smell thereof. I'm going to release this. I'm going to break it forth and place it upon him. My king is worthy. He is so worthy. See the worship here? Oh, what worship there is. It is conveying that he has the primary place in his life. Take the most precious thing you own and just put it at the feet of Christ. Is this not what the Lord moved Abraham to do? Take thine son, thine only son. Take him who means everything to you, Abraham. Hard to love the Lord this way. We are so carnal. May God give us grace. Whatever the spike nard is, let me tell you, whatever it is that you can offer, you bring it. You might not have all the wealth of the world. You can bring your being. You can bring yourself. That's really what the Lord's looking for. If He gets you, He'll get your money as well. <laughs> whatever He needs of it, He'll get. Verse 13. A bundle of myrrh is my well-beloved unto me. He shall lie all night betwixt my breasts. My well-beloved. A title for the Lord here. That's what he ought to be through the child of God. That's why we give the spike nard without hesitation. My well-beloved. And it reflects the primacy that he has in their affections. But myrrh, another spice here. A bundle of myrrh. A bundle of myrrh is my well-beloved unto me. What is being conveyed here? Well, myrrh, of course, is, is fragrance. It is 
an aroma again, but what does it reflect? Well, here's how I understand myrrh. Myrrh is that aroma and fragrance that reflects something without corruption. That's its message, without corruption. It deals with corruption. I think to this day in parts of the world, people, they, they, they burn like myrrh as an incense to, to, to have this kind of imagery, really. This, this, it's, it's like dealing with the um, airborne bacteria or whatever. It deals with that which is not good. And myrrh conveys this sense of purity. Speaking of Christ in Psalm 45, verse 8, wonderful Christological psalm there, it says, all thy garments smell of myrrh. All thy garments. Your garments, that, that, your life, your life, all of your life smells of myrrh. It, it smells as if there's no corruption there whatsoever. The aroma of a life without sin. For that reason then, it is not strange that at his birth, Matthew 2.11, they gave unto him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Here is one who is born without corruption. Without Adam's corruption. He has been preserved from that. He has been born of man. He is, he is born of our bone and flesh of our flesh. But he is without the corrupting influence. Myrrh. And it's the same reason then that myrrh is there whenever his body is taken to be wrapped at his death. In John chapter 19 and myrrh, myrrh comes into play there. Myrrh is also offered to him mixed with bitter wine on the cross. We read in Mark chapter 15 verse 23, which he refuses. I thought about that. Why did he refuse it? Well, there are a number of reasons why he would refuse it. But I wonder symbolically why did he refuse it? Is there a sense that there the myrrh is tainted with the, with the bitter wine? And so his, his myrrh, his, his fragrant life, his, his life without corruption can't be tainted with anything else. I don't know, I put it for your, for your own meditation, beloved, how myrrh comes into the life of Jesus Christ, showing that he is without sin. Here it is. A bundle of myrrh is my well-beloved. He is that which is without corruption. He shall lie all night betwixt my breasts. Or others translate it as it shall lie all night betwixt my breasts. And I think contextually that is right. It shall lie. That is, the bundle of myrrh lies all night, not him of course, he is, he is as the bundle of myrrh. That's the point. A bundle of myrrh is my well-beloved. He is as a bundle of myrrh. And so whether it's it or he doesn't really matter. The same truth is being conveyed. But it shall lie all night betwixt. I'm treasuring that, that, that sweet scent of a sinless life. Think on the sinlessness of Christ, beloved. Marvel at it. How contrary it is. In your life, how different it is and then how it has became, become yours by imputation. Of course, she wants to hold on to it. A bundle of mirrors, my well beloved. She's holding on to it. She's, she's, she's holding on to it close to her. She doesn't set it on the shelf. She doesn't set it away. She, she holds it all night betwixt her. She's holding it to her chest. Why would she do that? Why would she do that? She wants its influence in her own life, doesn't she? She wants the aroma to rub off. The tighter she holds it, the longer she holds it, the more the scent comes off on her. Is it not the same with the Lord? Keep the Lord close and His sinless life will begin to rub off. You'll begin to see the exceeding sinfulness of sin and you will long for the purity of Christ. You will hate what he hates. You will love what he loves. And you will understand when Peter says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And you will say, Oh God, I will be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. I want it. I want it. Rub that, that, uh, that sinless life into me. Let me know it near to me. May I begin to have that purity of Christ more and more my own experience. You can't walk holy with the Lord at a distance. You can't. You can't. This was Peter's fault, wasn't it? He followed afar off. And he couldn't stand in the time of temptation. Neither will you. 
in the time of temptation, if Christ is afar off, you will sin. We can become more holy, you know. This is why she's holding on so tightly. She wants his beauty and purity to become her own. All night betwixt my breath, all night, all night, I'll treasure it all night. Is that what you want? Do you want to be more holy? That godly man, McShane, make me as holy as is possible for a justified sinner to be. What a prayer. What a prayer. Make me as holy as is possible for a justified sinner to be. I think we are content if we just manage to get through days without making a complete mess of our lives. As long as there's nothing overtly abominable, we're content. But we're to increase. Oh, the hymn writer, my heart has no desire to stay where doubts arise and fears dismay. Though some may dwell where these abound, my prayer my aim is higher ground. I want higher ground. Take me higher ground, Lord. Take me to higher ground. And verse 14, my beloved, is on to me as a cluster of comfort in the vineyards of Engedi. A couple of words here, very interesting. The word cluster literally is eshkel in Hebrew. It's found first in Genesis chapter 40 verse 10 and more significantly, I think, in Numbers chapter 13. Where in Numbers 13, if you want to read it, it's verses 23 and 24. I know I need to be quick here to finish up, but I just want you to see these words, a cluster of camphor, this cluster being eshkel. In Numbers 13 to 23 it says, And they came onto the brook of Eschol and cut down from thence a branch with one cluster, one Eschol of grapes, that's the Hebrew. And they bare it between two upon a staff, and they brought of the pomegranates and of the figs. The place was called the brook Eschol because of the Eschol, cluster of grapes, which the children of Israel cut down from thence. You have synonymously here Eschol with cluster, and especially a cluster of grapes. So the term cluster is closely identified in Scripture with grapes. Eshkol was called Eshkol because of the, the size of the grapes. You see what happens here? There are two men holding a pole and the cluster of grapes. It's two men to carry the cluster of grapes. Don't miss the scene. It's so significant. It's so massive. It's so monumental. It's so significant. Eshkol, that's the name, cluster. Cluster of grapes. And of course, what's gra- what are grapes used for? used to make wine. And what substance that is used throughout Scripture to symbolize the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to keep that in mind because then we read of camphor. We read of that camphor, a cluster of camphor, an eschol of camphor. And camphor really is, is kufr, that's it in the Hebrew. The term has the idea of a ransom or satisfaction closely associated to the Hebrew word kafar, kofar, kafar. And kafar is the word translated atonement. It's amazing, tremendous here. John Gill says about kofar, the word here that we have as camphor, is so closely related that John Gill says, quote, some leave the word untranslated kofar, which has the signification of atonement and propitiation. And so you have atonement reflected here. You have atonement reflected in what? In the cluster, in the eschol, in the place of grapes. In that which brings forth the wine. What a picture. And thus you might say that she said, My beloved is unto me as the eschol of atonement, as the cluster of atonement, as the grapes of atonement, as the very blood that makes atonement for the soul. What a picture. And this is what Christ is to his people. My beloved is on to me as a cluster of comfort in the vineyards of Engedi. 
I see there the wine. I see. I see the propitiation made there. Oh, the price that was paid to remove condemnation. I come to our final point. The compliments they exchange. The compliments they exchange. Verses 15 through 17. I'll not look at all of this, but verse 15, the, the grammar is feminine, indicating that the king is addressing the bride. He is saying, Behold, thou art fair, my love. Behold, thou art fair. Thou hast dove's eyes. I thought about these dove's eyes. I'm not going to look at all of this here, but the dove's eyes... Eyes are an important part of beauty, especially for a woman. So much so that this is why women take so much time, usually, in their artistry around their eyes. <laughs> and they will use certain instruments to make the lashes kind of curl up and make the eyes bigger and accentuate all of it. They do all of this and they add shadowing and so on in order to accentuate the eyes because the eyes are, a, are, are, are something of beauty. Now, I'm not getting into the rightness and wrongness of that, but I'm just saying that's a fact. That's a fact. Accentuating the eyes, trying to accentuate the beauty itself. Of course, the dove reminds you of what? What does the dove remind you of? Come on, you know in your head. It reminds you of that which came down upon Christ. The Holy Spirit came upon him at his baptism in the form of a dove. And so you have here this symbolism this picture of the beauty that has dove's eyes, you have a beauty that has brought to you, that has conveyed through you, that has worked out through you by the Spirit of God. That has dove's eyes. I can see the Spirit of God in you. The beauty of the bride is a product of the Spirit of God. The beauty of the church is a product of the Spirit of God. In all of our desire for holiness and what we've talked about already, what is our dire need? The Holy Spirit, that blessed Spirit of God whom we should not grieve or drive away because without His sweet influence, without His power, we can never live the life of Christ. Dear Christian, cry for the Spirit of God. You cannot live an attractive Christian life without Him. And any progress you made really redounds to Him. Verses 16 and 17, the church responds in admiration. Behold, thou art fair, my beloved. Yea, pleasant also, our bed is green. Our bed is green. Our, bre- our bed is fresh. That's, that's really the term, green, fresh. That's what the term indicates. The bed, of course, is a place of connection, a place of fellowship. And the question then is asked, is our fellowship fresh? Is it with the Lord? Are you going on enjoying the freshness of communion with God? I look at myself and I ask myself the same question. Is my fellowship fresh or is it somewhat stale? Oh, can you see? Can you see the love? Can you see the love that the bridegroom has for the bride, reciprocated by the bride back to the bridegroom? This is the whole point of the book. We love him because he first loved us. He is showing that love. He is conveying that love, that appreciation, that sense of valuing her. And she senses that. She reciprocates back and she just loves and adores in return. And this gets back to the point, the whole drive of the book is to show that in the believer's walk with God, it covers every spectrum of his being. His emotions are to be engaged. He is to love Christ. Not just say the right things. He is to actually love the Lord as God with all his heart, mind, soul, and strength. Do you... No, you don't. I can answer for you. You don't. And I can answer for me. But there's something in you, child of God, that wants to. You just, Lord, help me to love you more. As I say that, you would say the very same thing, wouldn't you? You'd say the same thing, Lord, help me to love you more. Whatever whatever my spike nerd is, give me grace to daily bring it before you. Just leave it there because you're worthy. You're the most valuable thing in my life. No substitutes. 
And if you don't relate to this at all, <laughs> you're sitting there thinking, what's he talking about? I can tell you now, you're as blind as you could possibly be. You don't know anything of spiritual life. You know nothing of the Spirit's work in regenerating grace. And that's why you don't understand. And that's why you need to repent and plead to God he'd give you a new heart. May you pray that. May God grant it to you. Let's pray. Let's all seek the Lord now.